So let's talk about what you've been up to because you just got back to the Midwest, you said last night. So yeah. um, what, what have you been doing for the last whatever month and a half? Yeah, so it started pretty much back in October. We went up to, there was a few rookies that went to Lake Placid, New York for team trials. Um, we stayed in Lake Placid for a month and that's where we got our first bobsled experience pretty much um, on ice. And then after that, um, we started the North American circuit. So we went to Whistler, Canada, Calgary, Park City. And then from Park City, we actually went over and did um, the Europa Cup in Europe um, and slid on three different tracks there. Then came back for the last race at Lake Placid. So pretty much the last three months have been kind of everywhere. So October really was the first time you'd ever really been on a bobsled? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it was wild. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared for my life actually. And Lake Placid is a really tough track. It's one of the toughest in the world. So it's really rough and bumpy. So they say, if you can do this one, you can do any of them. And about the first day I was like, I think I'm done. This isn't for me, but um, it gets better and it becomes fun actually. So. Um, so I know you were, you ran track in college, right? At Wayne? Correct. Yep. So what, uh, I know there is a little bit of history as far as like runners getting into doing bobsled. So what, what drew you into it or how, how did you start making that connection? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I was just listening to, um, Joel Osteen radio and he talked about a former track athlete that went to, um, get into bobsled because they kind of need the same things like strength and power as a short um, sprinter and so it just got me thinking about it I thought about it for probably a month and I was like I don't even know what bobsled is and um, but then I looked on the website and I saw there's combines every summer um, so then I talked to my dad I just kind of mentioned it to him and he's like we're booking flights let's go and I was like all right here we go so um, just one thing kind of led to the next and um, yeah I pretty much just heard about it on the radio and I was like what like I knew of bobsledding from the Olympics but I never like looked into it or how people got into it so that's kind of how it started for me when did that happen or when did you start first hearing about that or um that would have been a in april just this last past, year yeah this past april and then i went to a combine in the beginning of june the first weekend in june um scored high enough there then you get asked to come back for rookie camp so then i went to rookie camp in lake placid in august for a week and you kind of do like a push championship kind of thing. <clears throat> and then um, they ask you if you place in the top three to come back for team trials. So that's kind yeah. of the process. And you said your dad booked you a flight. So you went where when you guys did that? Um, so <clears throat> him and I actually went to Park City, Utah and did a combine out there. Okay. Um, and okay. So you, you mentioned here in the podcast by Joel Osteen first. Uh, I don't suppose that was referring to Lolo Jones, was it? No, it wasn't. <clears throat> but then after, I mean, I had known she was doing bobsled, I believe, at that point. But um, no, it was somebody like way back in the day. Mm, now I okay. can't even remember her name. Which, yeah. But. Yeah. Um, so what what happened out in Park City that first time you went out there? So did you not get in a bobsled that time you went out? No. Or? No, we didn't even touch a real bobsled until actually team trials. Like we saw them, but there was no ice. Obviously it's not cold enough. But so in Park City we did, it's just like a sprint test, um, a shot test, like a shot, underhand shot toss, and then um, standing broad jump. And basically they just want to see, you know, if you're fast enough and strong enough, you have to hit these certain standards to get to the next level. So, um, yeah, I didn't have a bob I didn't know anything about bobsled. <laughs> but you you qualified. I mean, you did well enough at that that they wanted you to keep, keep yep. going with it. <clears throat> so you have to score over 500 points um, doing those, and I did. So then I went to rookie camp, and basically, um, it's still not cold enough for us, so we still didn't go um, on a bobsled. But we did like they have a push track in Lake Placid, so it's like a makeshift bobsled on wheels that you can practice the hit they call it and pushing kind of and running and jumping into something so um yeah the first time you get in a bobsled you're literally at the top of the track and they're like all right here we go and I was like I've never jumped in I don't know what I'm doing I I mean it was pretty terrifying and then when I got done I was like I'm I was really dizzy and sick um but 
thankfully it got a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you mentioned that the first time you were actually in, you know, real bobsled was what October you said. Yeah. What's what's the preparation leading up to that as far as like kind of getting ready for that experience or how you know what were you doing mm -hmm. building up to that? Um, pretty much we were just like training. I mean lifting, working out. But that's, I mean, there's nothing that can prepare you for the ride. It is just, uh, I literally just prayed the whole way down. I was like, I swear, I'll never get in one of these if I make it out alive. But, um, yeah, there's, there, you can't even really describe it to someone. And that's what everyone would tell me. But I was like, eh, it's fine. Like, I'll be fine. And then it was, it was a rush. Even coming back from doing the other tracks, um, you know all over the world and then coming back to Lake Placid like I got just as sick the first time because it's just so different than all the other tracks so it's kind of like getting acclimated to that rough ride again yeah. <laughs> um, so can you give me like a, a little bit of a detailed rundown of that first time you know doing that track the first time in Lake Placid that you did <clears throat> yeah um, so I was like cotton mouth I was so nervous because I mean I had heard about it I you just don't know what to expect so Basically, you just we stood behind the bobsled, ran and jumped in. Um, you have foot pegs that you put your feet on, and then you like lay forward basically and hold on to metal bars, and that's um, <clears throat> all that's keeping you in there really. But it's just it's 20 curves, and at that point you don't know the track, so you're just your head is just bobbing in there because you don't really know what to like. You don't know which way you're gonna turn. Um, so you, we rattled the whole way down. You're hitting your knees and elbows and everything. And then um, when you come out to the outstretch, they'll tap you on the shoulder and pretty much like tell you to pull the brakes. That's the only time you touch the brakes. Um, and then we had to get out and push the bobsled because it was so warm that the ice hadn't like, it wasn't fast enough to take us to the finish dock. So then you're pushing like this 400 pound sled up this mountain, it feels. Um, and I was so dizzy. I was like, I'm gonna puke everywhere. <laughs> and um, I actually did puke later, but um, I was supposed to go twice and I like physically couldn't do it. My head was spinning so bad, but um, yeah, after that, each time got a little better. I took Dramamine then for the next ones. Um, but it's so funny cause that's the only track like that. Like I can do all the other ones fine and not be dizzy, but this one for some reason is just, it's rough for sure. Um, so it doesn't sound like the most fun experience that first time doing it. What, what brought you back or what did make you decide that you wanted to keep doing it despite that experience? Right. Well, I had seen, you know, I just, from talking to other people, they're like, this happened to us too. Don't worry about it. Like, um, and then just kind of the experience that I was having with meeting everybody and seeing how it can take you all over the world and meet new people. Um, I knew that God had opened this door, so I was just going to kind of stick with it. Um. But yeah, I was definitely, I texted my mom, I was like, this isn't for me, I, I can't do this. But um, I'm really glad I stuck with it because it was definitely worth it. Um, I know that, yeah, historically there has been, you know, crossover between track and bobsled. Do you know Herschel Walker, you know who that is? Um, I think maybe, I don't okay. think he, so. He was an old uh, NFL football player that ran track in college as well. And then he also competed in the Olympics for bobsled too. Oh, nice. Um, but anyway, so, how, how for you have you felt like you experienced that crossover? How has your track career um, translated into um, helping with your bobsled crew now? Yeah, I mean, a lot of like the lifting stuff we had to do, track workouts, like our short sprint workouts, I um, continue to do those now, just kind of remembering what we did because it's it all crosses over basically, just like strength, um, power behind the sled, pushing stuff, um, you know, running with stuff behind your back just to make you stronger. So. Um, a lot of the workouts that I did and lifting stuff is what I would do to get ready for bobsled, pretty much, so. Yeah. Why, I mean, is there an explanation of why it is, though, that track does translate so smoothly into bobsled that somebody can go, I mean, like Lolo Jones, for example, right. goes right into being an Olympic-level bobsled right. without ever having done it in her life? Um, it's speed and power. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, if you're fast, you're obviously going to hopefully be fast behind a bobsled, but... Um, a lot of people, you need both though. You need to be strong and fast because some people are just fast and can't push the sled as fast. Um, so yeah, I mean, really you can become pretty good. It's just as a brakeman, you don't really have to do much. You just get the sled moving for about 30 meters and jump in and hold on. Um, obviously a pilot takes a lot more experience and 
getting into that. But um, yeah, you pretty much, all you have to do is run 30 meters and push them as fast as you can. So um, it's, you can pick it up pretty quickly. And you do the two person sled, right? Yep, women only have two at this point. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So women don't have four level, four percent Olympics uh -huh. or anything? Okay. Not at this moment. Huh? Okay. Um, and what, uh, so you're, you're a brake man. Mm -hmm. What, uh, so why, why the brake? I mean, you know, not that I know any <laughs> difference between the two right. jobs. Right. Um, it is pretty much where you start out 90% of the time. Um, a pilot, you have, there's just so much technique and it's good. People always say it's good to start as a brakeman anyway, because you need to know what it feels like to go down and what the brakeman goes through, um, before becoming a pilot. But um, there is driving schools <clears throat> that um, like I could get into, but it's just a lot of lot of work and dedication and to be up there, <clears throat> I would pretty much have to live either in Park City or Lake Placid. but um, yeah, you pretty much always start out as a brakeman though. Um, so starting in October, let's let's walk through some of your experiences and what you've got to do because I know you've spent some time overseas so, um, you know, how, how did that progress or how did that lead where you've been able to do so much traveling? Yeah, um, it's been just the biggest blessing. Like we were in Canada for the month of November, um, up in Whistler and in, in Vancouver area, which it, all these places are absolutely gorgeous, especially if they've had an Olympics there. I mean, the towns are magnificent. Um, so <clears throat> we got, to, I was in Canada for the first time to do that. And then in Calgary, um, going back to Park City, my pilot and I actually crashed in our race in Whistler, so she didn't get points. So in order to, like, she was still fighting for an Olympic spot at that point. Um, in order for her to get points, um, she would have had to go over to do Europe. And so she asked two of the brakemen, myself and Kyle, um, if we'd go over there with her. And we're like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll definitely do that. So we went over there and um, she raced La Plan, France. And then we just did two other tracks for practice while we were over there. But um, yeah, one thing kind of just led to another. It wasn't planned to go to Europe right away, but since we had crashed at the beginning of the season, she needed to make up points. And so she's like, well, our only option is to go to Europe. And we're like, all right, let's go. So um, so tell me uh, where, where all you've been at this point now. Where, where has Bob's led, led you? <clears throat> so Canada, obviously, um, Whistler and then Calgary. Uh, Lake Placid, I'd never been to New York before. Park City was my combine, and then I went back for the NAC race there. And then we went to Germany, France, Switzerland, Austria, and we just pretty much, it was not like we backpacked Europe, but we drove everywhere because we had a bobsled in the back. Um, so it was, I mean, I was like, am I really over in Europe doing this? Like seeing all these places that, you know, I've only dreamed of. So um, it was absolutely amazing and these places are mountain towns the tracks are up in the mountains it, it it was absolutely beautiful so pretty lucky for that was was this the first time you've been overseas much or had you had you traveled a whole lot before this um i had only been to greece i went on a mission trip there <clears throat> like a few years ago but um yeah that was my just my second time back to europe hmm. so um was it a eye-opening experience at all or I mean was it something that you were like you know just experiencing life outside of the U.S. for the first time oh yeah it, everything's different all the money everything and it's weird when I mean everyone knows English pretty much but it's not necessarily their first language but it's kind of crazy how they'll always know at least a little bit of English and I'm like I don't I don't know German or French you know but um you know all just the different currency we had to use like just traveling you know from the Swiss franc to the euro um, just having the whole culture, like how they, what they eat, um, it was just all different, but it was all really fun. Like it was so fun to experience their culture that way. And then, um, <clears throat> the people that we met over there doing bobsled, it's just like a whole nother world. Um, we have so many friends from all these different countries now and we keep in contact and, um, it just it opened so many doors it feels like connections wise um you know it's like we have people in switzerland who are like if you come back you can stay with us and you know um i think just the people and just being able to travel and see was i mean all that was mind-blowing and then on top of it getting to bobsled which is a pretty rare thing so um you did not you are not going to the olympics 
correct? Correct, yes. Okay, <laughs> so being a rookie in this sport, I mean, did you have realistic hopes, do you feel like, early on of qualifying for the Olympics this time around? Um, we kind of knew at the beginning because at team trials, we actually didn't even get to compete to make World Cup, um, and World Cup is where the Olympic team gets picked from. Um, it was just kind of a weird year because normally rookies do get to compete, but since it was an Olympic year, everything had gotten moved up, and they were kind of on a fast track um, on certain things. So there was always a chance, a little bit of a chance. I mean, probably like a 1% chance, but um, being a rookie, and people have been dedicated their lives to this. The six people on the World Cup pretty much do it full time. Um, and so to come in, you would, it would have been a miracle, but um, pretty much the next quad is what I'd be going for. And when's that gonna happen? <clears throat> in Beijing, it'd be 2022, I believe. Okay, so um, let's see. I've, I've, I've still got a lot of questions left. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, that's Are okay. you doing anything else today, or uh, do you have? I mean, no, I'm just anything? getting my life back together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about your life um, outside of it. Obviously, with all this travel, you know that um, would inhibit you from having, you know, a full-time job right. or whatever. So, what before you started training and doing this bobsled thing? What were you doing? So I'm technically I'm still employed with CenturyLink and they have been amazing. They let me basically take four months off and I can work when I can. Um, when, when I went over to Europe, it was pretty hard, the time difference and the internet connection was terrible. But before that, I would try to work a little bit each day, even if I was in Lake Placid or um, up in Canada. I would work a little bit before we would go train or I'd, I'd work after. <laughs> so, um, yeah, pretty much they have just granted me this time off to go, um, and they've helped me. They've raised money for me. They've um, just been amazing. So, yeah, pretty much tomorrow I'm going back to work. <laughs> it's just yeah. back to real life. So. And what do you do for them? I'm a field engineer. Um, so we're designing, like, a whole new fiber network everywhere, and I'm kind of – I manage it, I should say, at this point. What was your – so what did you major in at Wayne? Um, I was, it, I got interdisciplinary studies. Um, I never knew what I wanted to do, so you just kind of like bop around. And so basically I have like a math and education degree, but I never a student taught. I just have enough credits in both of them. It's, I don't know, it's a weird one. I was never like specific in what I wanted to do. And so that's kind of what led to that. So how long have you been working for CenturyLink now? Um, it will, four years. Okay. Um, and what, were, what was their thought, you know, when you first brought this um, proposition to them that you were going to be, you know, <clears throat> traveling and stuff? Yeah, they were um, amazing. For, right from the get-go, they were just excited about it, um, completely supportive, because I was worried about taking time off. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know if they would, I would have to quit. Um, but pretty much, like, I talked to my boss, I let him know, and then he talked to his boss, and they were... I mean, instantly they started to raise money for me. They were just like so excited. So, I mean, it was a huge blessing and I was so thankful, still so thankful for them because I mean, I was able to make some money while I was on tour and traveling and um, that's also pretty rare, so. And is that, um, so again, looking towards the future, is that the plan now that you're gonna keep, keep working for Century League and keep training for 2022 potentially? Yeah, um, that's still kind of stuff <clears throat> I need to figure out, but um, I would, yeah, like to do that for sure. Um, maybe spend a little bit more time training just because these, the other athletes pretty much do it full time up there. Um, and so, I don't know, I'm trying to figure all that out, but definitely going to keep working and training for sure, so. How, how difficult is that to keep training being, I, I assume there's not a big bobsled scene here in Omaha, yeah. so how, <laughs> how tough is it for you when, when all of your potential um, you workout right. partners, whatever, are in other parts of the country. Right. Um, the nice thing is, is you don't have to do a lot with bobsled. I mean, n an actual bobsled. Um, so lifting, running, and doing that kind of stuff is what I'll do here. And then I'll take some time to go up to the push track in Lake Placid again for a few weeks over the summer. Um, and then we'll go to Calgary. They actually have an ice house, an indoor ice house there where we can practice too. So it'll just be like weeks or two weeks that I'll take, um, hopefully, I haven't really figured that out yet, but <clears throat> um, to go and actually work on the bobsleds part of it. Otherwise I'll just keep yeah, lifting and running and doing that kind of stuff, so. Mm -hmm. 
um, if you were to give a realistic um, look into the future, do you think you have a legitimate shot at making the team for 2022? I mean, that's <laughs> super hard to say, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to set my sights high and absolutely that's what I'm going for. So, um, Tell me about your uh, partner, um, your pilot for your particular bobsled and yeah. um, how you guys met or what, uh, what that connection has been. Um, like. So there was two pilots on the NSA tour um, and I raced with both of them. I won two golds with one and then a, sil or a gold and a fourth place with the other one. So um, basically they had team trials. There was five pilots total. Three of them make World Cup. Um, so the other two were our pilots basically. And we would have push-offs, um, race-offs to see who would race. So the fastest time obviously um, would get a race with the pilots. But we... Um, established like a really good friendship and that is also part of it like you know knowing you're comfortable with the person um, I mean I've crashed with well one of them twice and it's just almost like a bonding experience it really brings you closer just I mean in any sports you get closer but when you experience something like that together um, we were just talking about how it it just kind of bonds you in a in a special way so um, yeah we got really close with our two pilots and we're gonna definitely be sliding with them again so Tell for next about, season anyway talk talk me through that crashing experience and and what what that's like and uh, as you mentioned how it brings you closer to the person you do it with yeah so um it's that was always kind of fear just like the fear of the unknown of crashing because we knew it happens but um just that for getting that first one out of the way my first one was actually my first race um i had and so Normally crash races are a little worse because you're not wearing as much like padding and gear, um, but you do have a burn vest you always wear. But um, we were in Whistler, which is the fastest track in the world, and there had been so many crashes. People crashed there all the time. Um, and <clears throat> it was a really first smooth six curves, like it was going good. And then all of a sudden you kind of hear like a silence, and then you hear just like, because <sighs> you're, I mean, your body's like on the ice. Um, that was a pretty bad crash because you slide all the way down the track. No, you don't just stop. Um, so from seven to curve, I think 15 or 16, we, you know, go through it all and you flip back and forth, you barrel roll and you're just inside holding on. And I screamed the whole way down. I was so scared. <laughs> but after like, you're kind of just, your adrenaline's going. Like I was, I felt fine. But, um, after now looking back, like my shoulders, got really bad burn not burns but like almost like ice burns and bruise because you're just like landing on them um but then yeah we the track workers catch you basically they catch the sled and then you crawl out but um i mean it's just it is a crazy experience like you just it's terrifying but um like you're all okay it's happened a few times and it's okay you you feel okay you just want to make sure you don't have a concussion and they'll go through all that protocol with you but um it's yeah it's it i think it looks scarier than it actually is i've seen crashes and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> and, um when you're just in the moment you're just holding on and brain it goes okay so mm -hmm. um let's talk about uh your family in in this whole experience and uh what they meant to you or how you, i mean it sounds like your dad's been obviously very supportive so mm -hmm. um how, how have they uh how is this relationship with your family um, been through this whole process yeah it's um they from the minute I told them they were all super supportive um I told my mom about it and she's just like I, I don't know what it is but you know I'll support you I told my dad he's like yep let's do it um my brothers have been huge support for me like <clears throat> my brother in Houston started a website for me where I can up like um update people and like where I'm at the experiences races um and all that kind of stuff um they're just, they're so excited about it. A lot of people ask them about it too. Um, I think it's almost like brought us closer and it's, it's in a weird way, it's pretty cool that, um, that they're so supportive of it. Obviously my mom and dad, I knew they would be, but um, it's just fun to have everybody be excited about it. Um, and yeah, it's definitely brought us closer for sure. Um, and you, have you had a chance to travel with some of them as far as going overseas or in the US? 
Um, they didn't, they came out to, a few of them came out to Park City, but it was, this was the first season, so I, like, didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know if I was going to race at any time. Like, you only found out a few days before, because we would always have race-offs at the stops we were at. Um, so, I was just trying to figure it out this season, and then I was like, I'll, you know, I'll let you know when you can come. And then it just ended up not working out for them to get out there, but next year... If I make World Cup, they'll definitely come and watch. When's uh, when's going to be your next time in a in a sled at this point? Mm, I don't know. That's sad. Probably. Um, I know one of my one of the pilots and a uh, brakeman are going out to Whistler in March for some sliding practice. Um, if I can make it out there, hopefully then. Otherwise, it'll probably be literally October. Yeah. So got to go through that experience again. I'm being terrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, uh, you know, since obviously you're, uh, grew up in Norfolk and um, we've kind of got to build in that local angle mm-hmm. as well, um, just uh, tell me a little bit about your life growing up in Norfolk. And you went to Catholic, is that Yeah, right? Norfolk Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me about, you know, what, uh, what your life was like growing up and, you know, getting into running and everything. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just, I always kind of joke, like I had a really easy childhood and upbringing, like, um, had two older brothers that were my best friends, had went to Norfolk Catholic, was a great school. Um, yeah, pretty much I, I had a pretty easy go about for sure. Um, athletics were obviously my passion and um, it kind of just led from one thing to the next. I don't know. <laughs> what, uh, what then led you to Wayne or how did, how did you end up there? Um, Coach Kneifel, definitely, he's the volleyball coach there, and he absolutely brought me there. I mean, I didn't really know if I wanted to do sports. I was kind of just, like, in that bratty age of, I don't know what I want to do. I want to go, you know, to UNL. But um, I went to a volleyball practice. Um, I was watching my boyfriend play baseball at the time there, and I went and watched a volleyball practice, and I just fell in love with the girls at the time that were there. And Coach Kneifel, he is just He's so charismatic and just, he can bring anybody there. And it was honestly the best decision ever, for sure. So you did volleyball and track there? Yep. So I started with volleyball. I did four years volleyball. And then my last two, I also did track, but. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you, what year would you have graduated? I graduated in 12. Okay. Um, So in, in the time since you graduated has, have athletics between between graduation and Bob's at Have Athletics been part of your life at all? <laughs> the funny thing is no. Um, I literally wasn't even like a member of a gym for like two years. I moved to Minnesota. I would do stuff competitively like randomly, but um, it was always something I wanted to continue. I just didn't know what to do. And so, um, you know, I would, I would stay in shape, but there was nothing that I was like, not like across I was never doing like CrossFit or anything like active it was just like on my own doing what I want but um, I definitely didn't want it to be over and so I just when this door opened I was like this is a way for me to get you know back into doing stuff that I love so that's Um, how that worked out um, and now do you have to do anything like doing CrossFit or is it all just kind of your own workouts or what Um, I have a trainer that I worked out with before I started tour Um, he is one of my brother's friends, Lornell McPherson. He played for the Huskers. Um, so he would, he would make up workouts for me and do all that kind of stuff, which is so nice because I would have no clue what to do. Like after a while, I just start doing the same things. Um, but he <clears throat> was able to keep it mixed up and, you know, looked at things that were helpful for bobsled. Um, so I would work out with him probably three or four times a week and then do stuff on my own than other times. Um, if you could kind of summarize your experience with, with getting into bobsled and you know just a couple of sentences you know how would you sum up everything that's meant to you i would never take it back i know i would do it a hundred times over like it has been the absolute best experience to travel the country the people that i've met um the relationships that i formed just walking around with olympic athletes uh, it, absolutely incredible and i would it i would definitely do it again and i'm going to because it 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 really it just put life in perspective um, that there's more than just, you know, you can do stuff that you love, which is what I want to continue. So, mm-hmm. uh, ha- has it, I mean, have there been any people that you've met that, you know, famous names that, uh, that other people might know? 
Um, well, of course, like Lolo Jones or Ryan Bailey, he's a sprinter. Um, a lot of the bobsled people, I'm not sure, but like all the people going to the games this year for bobsled, obviously, I know and I've been around, hung out with. Um, they've been at the training center. Um, a lot of, a lot of, pretty much bobsledders, but some track athletes also. But yeah. um, so, uh, is this something? I mean, how long? I don't know what the um, career path of a bobsled person usually looks like, but um, how long do you think you're going to be able to stick through this game? You know? Yeah, um, I hope for the next four years at least. Um, probably after that I'll be done because I'll be old. <laughs> but um, definitely my goal is the next quad to stick through it, um, and hopefully my bike can hold up. A lot of people on the World Cup are 30 to 35 years old, so it is possible at least. And what have been some of your... Um, Accomplishments, or I know you just won a gold in something. Mm -hmm. You know, what are, yeah. what are some things you've been able to accomplish? Um, so, in the races, I there was a total of five, and I raced in three. Um, yeah, and we won. I think I was the only brakeman to win gold, and I won three of them. So, I think that was probably one of the biggest accomplishments, I would say. And ending uh, at Lake Placid track with two golds just really brought it all back for me because. That track literally makes me want to quit sometimes. And then, um, you know, for God to just end it with two golds, um, it was just special for sure. Um, and uh, what, what is the name of that competition of which you won gold? Um, so it's the North American circuit, and then there's different races. So in Whistler, there's Whistler, Calgary, Park City, and then Lake Placid. They're just race number one to eight, pretty much. Okay. Um, any other cool stories you feel like we should know or anything um, that um, you feel like we should know? Geez, talk about? I should have thought about this probably before. <laughs> mm. I mean, there's I mean, tons you know, of things. You know, I, but... just, I just know the little that I've had a chance to read up on you so far, and so I don't know what else you feel like would be relevant to, to this. Yeah. Um, geez, I don't know. I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. Um, if I could ask if, I mean, it sounds like you're a believer, um, mm -hmm. so d would you want to talk about your um, relationship with the Lord and how that has kind of worked through this whole process too? Oh, absolutely. It's um, everything pretty much for me. <clears throat> it, it, like, pretty much he opened the door for me and I just have kind of been taking a step. Um, I literally pray at the line every time before because it is still scary. I mean, not really that scary, but um, your adrenaline's going. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's I love sports because it's a way for me to be really connected with God, <clears throat> and that's all. That's a part of my life that I missed. I mean, I was still connected, but it's a way for me to be really connected. Um, and so that's it's been everything for me in bobsled. Um, I literally pray on the way down most times because I'm scared and just want it to go smooth. Um, you know, when I'm at the line, everything, before, after, during, um, it's been, it's definitely the biggest part of it for me, for sure. Um, and is that something that began, you know, with your family or going to Norfolk Catholic or, you know, has that um, happened since then? <clears throat> Um, definitely my parents. They, we were raised in a Christian environment and God was always first. Um, <clears throat> we always grew up that way. Um, definitely, yeah, ever since I was little, it's just been, it, it's just what it is. And that's how we grew up. So I'm thankful for that for sure. All right. Um, I don't think I have any other okay. questions at this point. So. My throat's actually getting so dry. Oh, that's all right. Um, <laughs> anything I'm else like, that you feel like we should talk about at this point or that you'd like to say? Just <clears throat> thanks for the support of people have been amazing to me. Raising money, donating, following, um, you know, texting or email, social media to follow up. Um, it really means a lot and I'm just excited for what's next for sure. Can, can you speak to that a little bit too about what, um, what that process is like? I mean, do you have to do all of your own fundraising or how does that work to be able to financially keep it supported? Um, people do it all different ways. My company raised a bunch of money. They had shirts made um, to sell. There was donors that bought the shirts and then all the proceeds went to me, which helped with everything because when you're on the North American circuit, you pay, literally pay for everything. 
um, all your travel, all your food, um, everything. Um, and then my dad has been a really big help, so I couldn't do it without those two things for yeah. sure. And what does what does your dad do? He are, is your family still in Norfolk? Nope, they actually all live in Omaha now. He is a financial advisor. Okay. But he still offices out of Norfolk, but kind of works everywhere. Is that what much. brought you to Omaha? Your fa like your family being here? No, I after college just moved here. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing, so I was like, oh, I'll go to Omaha and start life there. So. That's kind of how that happened. 